name of Jesus. Let's sing this together. We need no other hiding place. We need no other hiding place. Our hope is safe within your name. This we know. This we know. You promise never to forsake. Again, you will sustain. Yes, we know. Yes, we know. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for she. and the earth all of the heavens and the earth announce the fullness of your word this we know this we know and every enemy will flee and every enemy will flee as we In Jesus' name, will break every stronghold. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call His name. Jesus' name above every other. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power. Oh, hell the power of Jesus' name. Sing it out. I will call upon the Lord, for he alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shadows are no more, for he Safely to arrive. 
Father, we love you. Again, we thank you just for the chance to be in your presence. We thank you for your word. Now we pray that you will bless and speak through Pastor Jason as he comes and shares your word and teaches us today. Give him the words to speak and give us the hearts and minds to be open to receive what you have for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. As we continue through the book of Matthew, we're coming to chapter 11, chapter 10. As we spent three weeks in chapter 10, just looking at Jesus giving commands and instructions to his disciples. And then he sends them out in pairs to go and to proclaim the gospel. So chapter 10 was all about preparation to go out and the different things and words of wisdom that Jesus gave. Now chapters 11 and 12, what we're going to begin seeing is how people respond to Jesus and how Jesus responds to their response. But as we're getting into uh, chapter 11 this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about how Jesus responds when we doubt, when we have moments of doubt or we have a moment of questioning God. And as I was thinking about this, I'm just reminded of all the things that are going on in the world all around us all the time that can cause doubt. One of those things that can cause doubt in your life is, Kimmy and I were married, um, our first pregnancy was a miscarriage. You know, that created some doubts in there. And be like, well, Cammie, you know, struggled with, will I ever be able to have kids? Looking back, you're kind of like, well, yeah, we're definitely going to be able to have kids. Right? So, but in that moment, there was that, you know, there was that uncertainty of like, is this just going to be how it is? And that created a moment of doubt. I was talking to a friend of mine in ministry that we uh, went to the same seminary. We had been friends throughout the years. We had done some youth events together when we served in the same area before in the past and talking with him. And the pastor of his church has resigned, struggling with depression and had a plan to commit suicide. And just it, broke, it had broken his family and he stepped, he's, he's moved away from ministry. And it creates moments of doubt. There's a lot of things that can happen to, to you and around you that can create doubt. We live in a broken world, and things are broken around us all the time. I think of Peter being in the boat and Jesus coming to him across the water and walking on the water. They looked and they were scared, and Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's, just, it's me. And, they're like, and Peter's just like, hey, if it's you, tell me to come out there. And Jesus is like, well, come. Peter got out of the boat and started walking on water to Jesus. But something happened. For a moment, he took his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the storm around him. And he began to sink. Because he doubted. There's going to be things in your life. It's not if you doubt. 
the things of God, or there's going to be moments where you doubt. It's not if that comes, it's when that comes, because we do live in a broken world, and we are broken ourselves, and we are full of sin, and there's going to be moments where we doubt things, and we can't, Lord, is, are you really real? Are you really there? And we're going to have questions. So what do we do, and how do we respond when we have questions? And we're going to look at two things today of how Jesus responded to John the Baptist. I think they're going to be really important for us Moving forward, when we have those moments when we may doubt. You know, you may look at the world today and look at what's going on around our country and around the world and think, huh, things are bad. And you may have moments. So let's read together, beginning in chapter 11. We're going to begin, we're going to start with verses 1 through 6. So in Matthew chapter 1, it says, When Jesus had finished giving instruction to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. Now when John heard in prison what the Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples and asked them, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. What are you known for? If you ask, if I asked your family and your friends, those closest to you, hey, describe this person. If I went up to John England, hey, what would your friends, how would your friends describe you? What's the short snippet? Or if I, if I talk to Jason Woodcock, hey, how would your family, how would they describe you in just a moment? In just a short sentence or so. How would they, <laughs> his family's laughing. Yeah. <laughs> You know, sometimes your, your circumstances and interactions with people will impact how you view them. You know, if I, I imagine if we took a survey here of how, how would you describe Marty? Many probably would mention your, the music, right? They would mention that. They associate you with that. There's certain things that you could be associated with. Well, Jesus is associated with sharing the gospel. The gospel is the center of everything Jesus did. Because what did he do when he left he sent his disciples out and he went and he began to preach and teach all throughout the towns. Jesus moved from town to town with the message of the gospel because the gospel was the primary purpose of Jesus. We learned that in Matthew chapter 1. You shall name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And that's Matthew 121. So the gospel is just the center of who Jesus is. He's teaching and preaching everywhere he goes. And we see that the gospel is so important to Jesus that his final words to the disciples were centered around that. They often say that your final words can be some of your most profound or at least reveal what is most important to you. Well, Jesus' final words that we'll get to in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, it says, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What do you want his disciples to do? What was the final command that Jesus gave his disciples? Go and make disciples. Go and proclaim the gospel. Now that word go there, in the, the, uh, verse 19 in the Greek, we, we have English. Again, English is one of the more limited languages. Um, we're not as expressive as most of the other languages in the world, partly because, relatively speaking, our language is fairly new. Um, and so we're adding words to our vocabulary all the time. If you look at the dictionaries over the years, they, people just add words and add words. So the English language is still growing. But this word go is not just as simple as in like I get up and pack up and go somewhere. This idea of that word go that Jesus spoke in the original Greek was as you're going or as you're living your life, make disciples. So he's not saying to everybody that you have to get up and go to some distant country somewhere. He's saying as you're living, you're going to be going somewhere. So as you're going, make disciples. So that might be at your work, at your school, it might be your neighbors in the neighborhood you live in, it could be going to the store, living your life as you're going, make disciples. That's what we're called to do, because the gospel is at the center of who Jesus is. 
And he wants that to be at the center of who we are. So he gives these simple words, go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. It's a simple formula, but it's something that should be the backbone of the church today. That should be who we are. As we're going, we're making disciples. But see, it's really easy for us to turn ministry or turn the church into a place of entertainment. Or a place where we come, we sit, but we never actually go and do I can't tell you over the number of years of ministry, just the people that come to church only to check, check it off their box. Hey, I did my good deed. I went to church. I'm like, I, I don't think you understand this word church that you're using. Anybody ever see the princess bride? You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means, right? It's just, it's a great movie, right? And uh, Keith's with me. Yeah, it's a great movie. But yeah, so, but we use these words sometimes and they lose all their meanings in the sense of like, we keep saying, well, I go to church, I go to church, I'm part of the church. But being part of the church is this idea that we've come together in relationship with one another to make disciples, to walk together through life so that as we're going, we're making disciples and we're baptizing and we're teaching. The gospel, because it's the center of who Jesus is, should be the center of who we are. Now, John, going back to John here, John has a question that he sends, because John's in prison, he sends it, and he says, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? If you remember John the Baptist earlier, and if you, you can actually go to the book of John and read, read a little bit more about John the Baptist, but basically what John did is he came out and he ushered, hey, behold, the Lamb of God, he, the Messiah, the one that is to come. And, you know, he, says, he even says that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. This is the one, and he's pointing everybody to Jesus. John the Baptist said he must increase and I must decrease. But it's like in this moment right here when John is, is, is facing death, that he asks this question, hey, go ask, is he the one or is there someone else coming? See, when we face life and things like that, we could have these moments of like, are you really the one? I mean, think about it. John the Baptist, cousin to Jesus. He had a moment where he's like, I, I, I want you to clarify that again. Are you the one? Are you the one? And so what's Jesus do? He reaffirms John. And he says, go and tell John, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor hear the good news. And one is blessed who is not offended by me. What we're learning through the book of Matthew is the gospel is key because we desperately need the gospel. There's no way around it. As we go through the book of Matthew and as Jesus speaks more, as he proclaims more, the more he does, the more he reveals himself, it is just obvious, beyond obvious, that we desperately need the gospel because we are sinners. Even the best of us, John the Baptist, who Jesus said there is no one born greater than John among men, had a moment where he's like, can you just clarify that for me to make sure you are the one? He had his moment. So Jesus reaffirms him. But that affirmation is centered, again, around the gospel and what Jesus is doing and what Jesus is accomplishing. Now, why does the, the gospel need to be at the center of everything? Even in his list there, he says the poor receive the good news. That word good news is where we get our word gospel. The word gospel literally means good news. It says, the poor have hurt, received the good news, have received the gospel. Why is it centered? Because we are sinners. We could never live up to the standard of holiness that God has put. God has a standard. We will never meet it, ever. But there's hope. And that hope is Jesus. 
Because when we're saved, it's not just that God forgives us of our sins. It's that then God takes the righteousness of Jesus and puts it onto our account. Think about that for just a moment. Not only does God forgive you of your sins, he takes the righteousness of Christ and puts it on your account. That means when God looks at you and you're in Christ, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. What good news that is. Not only can we be forgiven, but we are made righteous. See, what happens is, is too many people think that we need to somehow make ourselves good enough for God. That I, I need to clean up my life before I, before I come and, and follow God. And I need, to be, I need to get better. I need to earn God's favor. I need to earn God's love. I need to earn all these things. But the problem is, is you will never, ever be able to earn it. Because even in the book of Isaiah, it reminds us that even our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. We need the righteousness of God put onto our account. And that is made possible through Jesus. I thought of two separate sections in the book of Romans that are just some of the most glorious words that a sinner could ever hear. First, Romans chapter 6, verse 22 and 23, it says, But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then Romans 8, verses 1 through 4, it says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For for what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In Christ, there is now no condemnation for those that believe. Those two verses there the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's no condemnation if you are in Christ. We have been given a gift in the gospel. And the gospel is at the center of all that Jesus is doing. What he has done, what he is doing, and what he will forever do, the gospel is at the center of it. The good news. The one has come. And Jesus reaffirms that to John. So how does the gospel impact our lives? The gospel gives us three basic things. We can list you know, numerous things. But I want us to look at redemption, freedom, and eternal life. What the gospel offers us. First, redemption. Redemption is possible for anyone. There is nothing that you can do. There's not a lifestyle you can live in such a way that you become unredeemable by God. I mean, think about it. Think about Paul. I mean, he was going around. He was literally killing Christians and imprisoning them and trying everything he could do to stop the church. If By all accounts, he seems to be unredeemable, right? But God redeems him. Look at what David did. King David. He went and took his best friend's wife. Yes, Uriah was one of the mighty men of David who followed him all throughout his time. And David was hiding in caves because Saul was trying to kill him. Uriah was the one standing beside him fighting. David stole his wife and had him killed. On paper, David looks unredeemable. But God redeemed him. That should bring you great joy, knowing that there is nothing you can do in which you have sinned so much and so far that you are unredeemable. The gospel truly is good news. Because all can be redeemed. So what do we do as believers? When we come across people in our lives who don't believe, we keep sharing. 
When we come across someone that seems so evil and so out of touch and just so beyond repair, what do we do? We keep sharing the gospel. Because all people are redeemable, including you. You are redeemable. Because of God's love in the gospel. And then also the gospel gives us freedom. Now, when we think about freedom in today's context, there's a lot of, a lot of things going on, right? It's like, do I have the freedom not to wear a mask? Do I have the freedom to wear a mask? Do I have the freedom to go to the store when I want? How I want? Do I have the freedom to go to a restaurant? Do restaurants have the freedom to even open? What's going on? We have all these questions that are floating around about freedom today. But see, freedom in Christ from a biblical Christian point of view is very specific. Is that we are now free from the bondage of sin... So that we can freely live for God's glory. So that now we can freely say, not my will be done, Lord, but your will be done. We are now free to glorify God no matter where we are, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter where we are at. We are now free through the gospel to glorify God and to live for him. This morning I was in my quiet time I was reading in Romans and I was in Romans chapter 6. And I just felt like it, I mean, it kind of goes along with this so well. And it got me thinking. So I want to read to you Romans chapter 6. Not the whole thing, don't worry. Um, just verses six, 16 through 18. It says, Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience to righteousness? But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you, are, you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. As Christians, we understand true freedom is being able to freely become a slave of Christ. Because you can only be a slave to two things. Sin or Christ. There's not any gray area in there. See, when people think, oh, I'm free to do what I want. No, you're going to be a slave to your sin. So we can either be a slave to sin or a slave to Christ and be able to live for God's glory, which the gospel is the only way that we could ever be free from the bondage of sin and freely live for the glory of God. So the gospel gives us that freedom and then eternal life. Uh, I've said this often over the years uh, to teenagers in youth ministry, but do you realize that you do have a superpower? We all do. Every single one of us is immortal. You can never die. You can't. Even if this physical body dies, guess what? You now have a spiritual body in which you live on. We're all immortal. We're all eternal. We could never, ever die. But how we experience that eternity could be vastly different. Again, just like you're a slave to sin, you're a slave to Christ, when it comes to your eternity, you're either going to be Pain and suffering in hell, or you're going to be at the you're going to be living with God for all eternity. The gospel gives us an eternity of grace and of hope and of love and of peace. You're going somewhere for all eternity. You're going to spend eternity somewhere, and the gospel gives us a hope in eternal life. It gives us a joy and a pleasure. So in this moment, John the Baptist seemed to have a moment of doubt. Jesus' remedy, he reminded him of the gospel that he has come to save and he has come to spread the good news. So when you have moments of doubt, what do we do? We turn to the gospel and remember, I am redeemable. I have been given freedom. And no matter what happens here, I will have eternal life in him. So when you have your moments of doubt, turn to the gospel. Now our next section, we're going to look at what else Jesus does. 
beyond that. So verses 7 through 15, it says, As these men were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who wear soft clothes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before me. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who has come. Let anyone who has ears listen. Earlier I asked you, what would people say about you? How would they describe you? Well, Jesus goes on here. Yeah, John seemed to have a, maybe a moment of doubt. He needed some clarity. He wanted some affirmation. And then Jesus goes on, gives him the affirmation, centered around the gospel, and then he, he proceeds to talk to the people about John. And there's three things in which he describes John, three ways, three, or three characteristics he gives to John. One, that John is strong and steady, that he practiced self-denial, and that he is a prophet. First, John being strong and steady, Jesus asked a rhetorical question that was kind of a, uh, I don't know, maybe more of a sarcastic type question we would call it. He says, did you go see a reed swaying in the wind? Which means like if you a reed swaying in the wind, it's like wherever the wind blows, a reed goes. And the obvious response is like, like, no, John was not that. John was steady and he had a message and his message never changed. So he talks about how John is strong and steady. And how he never wavered on his message. So Jesus reaffirms John in that way. And then Jesus goes on and says, John practiced self-denial. John was extremely popular. All right, Y'all know how celebrities work, right? The more popular you are, does it change how people treat you? Yeah. Okay, there's, there's celebrities that make so much money, right? And there's this popularity. Like I say, Peyton Manning is probably one of the more popular athletes from the state of Tennessee, right? Because he played at UT and all that kind of stuff. If Peyton Manning shows up in Knoxville at a restaurant, is he paying for his food? Probably not, right? They're just going to be like, oh, yeah, hey, 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 hey. If I walked into a restaurant in Knoxville, what are they going to do? Here's your bill. Pay it all, right? We get treated different. John had an opportunity to be one of those types where he could just go around and get everything free because everybody Loved John. And everybody just said he was a prophet and he's all these wonderful things. But John didn't embrace all that this world had to offer because he was proclaiming and living for the world to come. And so Jesus talks about that. How he didn't sell out for the world, but he was focused on his message. And then he calls John a prophet. Technically speaking, John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet because he prophesied before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and started the new covenant. So John the Baptist is the very last Old Testament prophet. And that's where you kind of see the mergings of the Old Testament and the New Testament coming kind of together between John and, and Jesus there in the Gospels. But he's the final prophet. And Jesus says he's even more than a prophet. He's the one who's to prepare the way. And not only that, he is the Elijah that is to come. Malachi 3.1 says, See, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. Speaking of John. And then later in Malachi 3.1 it says, Look, I am going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And Jesus says, Look, he has come in the spirit of Elijah. Jesus just spoke so glowingly 
of John the Baptist. This reminds me of something. In Revelation chapter 12, in verse 10, there's something that is going on day and night that could possibly trouble us. In Revelation 12, verse 10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of, God, of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come, because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been thrown down. Do you realize Satan accuses you before God day and night? He accuses the brethren. You remember the story of Job, right? Satan went before, before God and God said, have you considered Job? And he said, ah, he'll do this, he'll curse you. He was accusing Job. Satan is accusing you now. At this moment, Satan was accusing John the Baptist. But the hope that we have is we have an advocate in Jesus. Again, Satan can accuse you all he wants. But when God looks at you, because of the gospel, he sees the righteousness of Christ. And those accusations mean nothing. You see how Jesus spoke of John the Baptist in this moment? Oh no, he's strong and mighty. He's a prophet. He's even more than a prophet. He did what was right. Did what is true. That is what Jesus is saying about you in this moment. Those are my children. They are, they are loved and they are righteous and they are strong. The gospel truly is such good news. But it seems like in this moment, the nation of Israel has missed it. They've missed it. They've, been con they've become so consumed with this world and living in this world, they missed the prophet. They missed the messenger and they missed the gospel. It's almost as if they had stopped looking for the Messiah to come. And they were content with the life they had. See, and if we're not careful... We will miss God as well. We can get caught up in so busy in this life and living in this life and surviving in this world that we could lose sight that God is working in and around us all the time. He's always working. He's always moving. He's always saving people. We don't need to be like the Israelites who missed it. So how do we not miss it? What we begin with is we begin with the word of God. See, Jesus reminds them. Jesus quotes the Old Testament here when he speaks of John the Baptist. The word of God reminds us of who God is and how he loves us and what he's done for us. So we need to look to the word of God so we don't miss it. We're to read it, we're to meditate upon it, we're to memorize it, and then we're to live it out and to do it. And why do we turn to scripture so much? It's because it's the very word of God. And God wants you to know him. See, our God is not some God in some far-off galaxy, distant land that is unknowable and untouchable. God came to us, dwelt among us, so that we can know Him. But knowing Him begins and centers around the gospel. And if you want to know what God thinks and how He feels what he values, what he loves, and who he is, you turn to the word of God. And you read. He's revealed himself to us so that we can know 
and that we can have confidence. I was reading somewhere and came across um, a quote from David Platt, who was the um, he was the president of the International Mission Board for many year, for a few years, and he said, "God will be true to His word always. So to fight doubt without a foundation in the word is futile." What did Jesus do to affirm John? One. He said, turn and remember and see that the gospel has come. Reminds him of the gospel. And then what else does Jesus do? He speaks of who John is in Christ. And he quotes scripture. Brothers and sisters, it's not if doubt comes, when doubt comes, we run to God. And how do we hear a word from God? We open up the Bible. He has given us his word so that we can know him, so that we can be reaffirmed, so that we can be strengthened in our faith. So when you have those moments of doubt, keep reading the word of God. Keep praying. Keep seeking. Remember the gospel and turn to God in all things. Because no matter how bad you, you feel like you've, you've fallen or, or went astray, you're redeemable. And when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. I'm going to close with something that I, heard, I had a pastor I served with um, for many years. And he would, he would say this commonly, and he would he repeat it often, it seemed like to people, is that God just doesn't see you as who you are right in this moment. Because God is not limited by time and space. He sees all things as if they are happening now. Which means that God, when he looks at you, doesn't just see you now. He sees you as his faithful servant, worshiping him in spirit and truth for all eternity. You may have some moments of disobedience, but when God looks at you, he sees an eternity of faithfulness. How God sees you is important. And you want to learn more about how God sees you? Open up the Bible, and he will tell you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this time you've given us this morning to come, to worship you, to open up your word and be reminded of the gospel and how good it really is. And that even though the wages of sin is death, you have given us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, if there's anyone here today who has never given their life to you, has never repented from their sins and believed the gospel, Lord, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. That you would just stir their hearts in such a way that only you can. And that you would not allow them to leave this place until they confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that you raised him from the dead. So that they can be saved. So they can have the righteousness of Christ put on their account. And Lord, we just ask that in those moments of doubt that we turn to your word and be reminded of the gospel. That we are redeemable. That we are loved. And that you do see us as righteous. Lord, the gospel truly is such good news. Help us to be faithful to take that good news to everyone. As we go and as we live our life, help us to make disciples. Help us to remember that we have been freed from the bondage of sin so that we can freely live a life for your glory. May we echo the words of John. May we decrease so that you may increase. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to stand, we're going to sing, and we're just going to worship God. Because he is good, he is faithful, and the gospel truly is good news. Worthy of every song, we can sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. 
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up. Worthy of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy and holy, there is no I will build my life upon your love. I need a quiet space to rest in grace, a hiding place, there you are. When I need a remedy for all that's haunting me, when I'm at the end of me, there you are.
nothing, you're everything. I am nothing. You are everything. I am nothing. You are everything. I am nothing. You are everything. You are everything. You are everything. Bless you, Lord, Lord. Cause you are God. Sustainer of my everything. When I am weak, Lord, you are strong. Cause I am you, and you are God. Cause I am me, and you are God. And I